instead of solving these problems at the technical level, we could solve them at the psychological and spiritual level by so disciplining ourselves, by so doing something with ourselves, that we wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. And so, in accord with that motivation, we seek out spiritual teachers, psychological teachers, this, that, and the other. Could we somehow be made over so that we don't worry about the quaking mess by a spiritual discipline or whatever? <clears throat> and you see, if you examine that, that this wanting to not have it anymore. That precisely is the quaking mass. The thing that we object to about ourselves is precisely what we do about overcoming it. In other words, the activity that we employ in overcoming it is the mess that we object to. Do you see that? And it's very important to realize that. Then if you do realize it, you raise the question, then what can I do? What can I do to transform the faithful? into the state of mind of the true mystic. Well, if you are the quaking mass, there is obviously nothing you can do to transform yourself into the state of mind which you idealize as that of being the true mystic, the Christ, the saint, or whatever. So, you realize that uh, everything is phony, that uh, all your ideals are simply manifestations of the quaking mess trying to get away from itself and that you are put in the position of it, it is absolutely necessary for me to be different from the way I am but there's absolutely nothing I can do about it because being the way I am I cannot be different from that let's say this but that we can put it in different ways. I know that I ought not to be selfish, and I would very much like to be an unselfish person, but the reason why I want to be an unselfish person is that I am very selfish and would far more love myself and respect myself if I were unselfish. See? I know that I ought to love God, and... Uh, Whatever, and why do you want to love God? Well, because God is the biggest boss, and it's best to be on the side of the big battalions. <laughs> That's really why I want to do it. In other words, because I'm looking for the safety of my own spiritual skin. So I think I'll love God. All oh, sophisticated saints have known this. St. Paul understood it, St. Augustine understood it, Martin Luther understood it. They didn't know what the hell to do about it. But there was nothing to do. And yet something has to be done. Obviously. But you realize when you really look into yourself, there's nothing you can do. This, therefore, is our point of departure. That we here, perhaps, perhaps not, mutually realize there is nothing we can do to be anything else than what we are. To feel any other way than what we feel at this moment. And to 
be then this quaking mess, which has the capacity for the horrors about what life can do to us. However, this isn't as much of a blind alley, a cul-de-sac, as it sounds. Because if you discover a blind alley, it tells you something. Watch the flow of water when it crosses over an area of land. And you will see that it puts out fingers. And some of them stop because they come into blind alleys. The water doesn't pursue that course. It simply rises. And then it finds a way it can go. But it never uses any effort. It only uses weight, gravity. It takes the line of least resistance and eventually finds a course. Now we will do the same thing. Only we're ashamed of it. But we're going to do it anyhow. We think that when we come to a dead end, a blind alley, oh, I failed. Supposing the water at each place where a finger of water stretches out over dry ground and doesn't go any further because the land is too high, the water would say to itself, I failed. We would say it was neurotic water. <laughs> Just wait, and it will find a way. Now, when you find, you see, that there's, there's this predicament that I've been describing to you, that there's no way of transforming yourself to become this fearless, joyous, divine being as distinct from the waking mass. When is there's no way, this is not a gloomy announcement. It is a very, very important communication. It's telling you something. Because the, like the land is telling the water, this isn't the way to go. There's another way, try over here. So in the same way, life is telling you that's not the way to go. It's telling you the, the, the message underlying this is you cannot transform yourself is giving you the message that the you that you imagine to be capable of transforming yourself doesn't exist. an ego, an I, separate from my emotions, my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences, who is supposed to be in control of them, cannot control them because it isn't there. And as soon as you understand that, things will be vastly improved. we can go into this. What do you mean by the word I? We're going to make some experiments in this a number of different levels. But in the ordinary way, what do you mean by the word I? I myself. Your personality, your ego. What is it? Well, first of all, obviously, it's your image of yourself. It's composed of what people have told you about yourself, who you are, how they've reacted to you, and given you an impression that that's the sort of person you are. 
It's all your education goes into this, the style of life you put on, and so forth. But, she, but it's an image, it's an idea, it's your thought about yourself, and I suppose yourself is in fact not this, but is, to begin with, your total physical organs, your psychological organs, and beyond that, an organism doesn't exist as a, an isolated thing any more than a flower exists without a stalk, without roots, without earth. So in the same way, although we are not stalked on the ground, we are nevertheless inseparable from a huge social context. Of, well, to begin with, parents, siblings, people who work for us and everything. I mean, it's, it's just impossible to cut ourselves off from a social environment and also, furthermore, from a natural environment. We are that. There's no clear way of drawing the boundary between this organism and everything that surrounds it. And yet, the image of ourselves that we have does not include all those relationships. Our idea of personality of ourselves includes no information whatsoever about the hypothalamus, an organ of the brain, the pineal gland, really of the way we breathe, of how our blood circulates, of how we manage to form a sentence, how we manage to be conscious how you open and close your hand. The information contained in your image of yourself contains nothing about all that. And therefore, obviously, it's an extremely inadequate image. But nonetheless, we do think that the image of self refers to something. Because we, we have the impression, very strongly indeed, that I exist. And this isn't just an idea we think, my God, it's a feeling. It's, it's really substantially there in the middle of us. And what is it? What, what, what do you actually sense? Like, you know, when you're sitting on the floor and you feel the floor is there and it's real and hard. Okay, what are you sitting on the floor? What, are, what do you have the sensation of? You know, it's you here. When you're not hitting it. What is it? Well, in what part of your body do you feel yourself? The real I existing. We can explore this very deeply, but I'm going to give you a preliminary and superficial answer. The, the sensation which corresponds to the image of ourselves is a chronic muscular tension. Which has absolutely no useful function whatsoever. When you try, say, to concentrate, what do you do when you try to pay attention? When I was a little boy in school, I had sitting next to me another boy who had great difficulty in reading. As he worked over the textbook with its perfect piffling information, he groaned and grunted to try to read to get out the sounds as if he were heaving enormous weights with his muscles. Ah, uh, run! 
make your vision more fuzzy because if you want to see something clearly you must not make an effort you must simply trust your eyes and your nervous system to do their thing so you just look like that I was writing the other night and I completely forgot somebody's name but I knew that eventually my memory would produce it and I just sat for a while and said to my memory, you know very well who this person is. Please give me the answer. And so, boing, there it was. <laughs> because that's the way nerves work. They don't work by forcing them. And yet we've all been brought up to try to force our nervous activity, our concentration, our memory, our comprehension, and indeed our very love, we've tried to force it with muscles. Men will understand me if I say you cannot force by muscular effort yourself to have an erection. Women will understand me if I say you cannot force yourself with muscles to have an orgasm. It has to happen. And you must trust it to happen. And there is absolutely nothing you can do about it by using your muscles. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So, in precisely the same way. Well, let, let's complete the picture. So, therefore, the, the notion that we have of ourselves, of ego, is a compound of an image of ourselves which does not fit the facts and a sensation of muscular straining which is futile. So that what you conceive to be yourself is the marriage of an illusion and a futility. <laughs> so, well, what are we? If that isn't the case. Well, obviously, uh, if you want to take a scientific point of view by that mythology, then your, your organism, about which we know very little, and the organism, as we've seen, is inseparable from its environment. And so you are the organism environment. In other words, you are no less than the universe. Each one of you is the universe expressed in the place which you feel is here and now. You're an aperture through which the universe is looking at itself, exploring itself. And we're going to go into that much more deeply. So when You feel that you are a lonely put upon, isolated, little stranger confronting all this. See, you have an illusory feeling because the truth is the reverse. You are the whole works that there is that always was and always has been always will be only just as my whole body has a little nerve end here which 
is exploring and which contributes to the sense of touch. You are just such a little nerve end for everything that's going on. Just as the eyes serve the whole body and help it to find its way around, so you are, as it were, serving the whole universe. You're a cell in it. And it's exploring itself. So that you as a function, you, you are a function of all that. And therefore, if this is so, it just doesn't fit the... the other way around. I am a little lonely thing exploring all this universe and trying to get make something out of it, get something out of it, do something with it. And I know I'm going to fail because I know I'm going to die one day. So we're all fundamentally depressed. I think up all these fantasies about what's going to happen to us when we're dead, all that kind of thing. Uh, what's going to happen to you when you're dead? What do you mean you? If you are basically the universe, that question is irrelevant. You never were born and you never will die. Because what there is, is you. And that should be absolutely obvious. But it is not obvious at all. That should be the simplest thing in the world. That you, the I, is what has always been going on and always will go on forever and ever. But we have been bamboozled by religionists, by politicians, by fathers and mothers, by all sorts of people to tell us you're not it. Now, why, if I put it to you in this very negative way, you can't do anything to change yourselves, to become better, to become happier, to become more serene, to become mystics or anything. If I say you can't do a damn thing, can you understand this negative statement in a positive way? What I'm really saying is that you don't need to. Because if you see yourselves in the correct way, you are all as much extraordinary phenomena of nature as, say, trees, clouds, the patterns in running water, the shape of fire, the arrangement of the stars, the form of a galaxy. You are all just like that. There's nothing wrong with you at all. Except that I have to add this little flip. You, you, you have, in you, you do think there's something wrong with you. See? And there's no question, you do. We all object to ourselves in various ways. And I'm going to add, there's nothing wrong with that either. Because that's part of the flow. That's part of what is going on. That's part of what we do. So I don't, you see, I'm, 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 what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to deliver you from a sense of guilt. Because I'm going to teach you that you needn't feel guilty because you feel guilty. <laughs> of course you feel guilty. It's like someone put a match on you and you feel hot. So they taught you as a child to feel guilty and you feel guilty. They say, well, but if someone comes along and says, well, you shouldn't. That's not the point. I'm going to say, not that you shouldn't, but that you do and don't worry about it. And if you want to say further, but I can't help worrying about it, I'm going to say to you, okay, worry about it. <laughs> this is the principle called in Japanese judo, meaning the gentle way. Go along with it, go along with it, go along with it.
So therefore, this is the beginning of meditation. You don't know what you're supposed to do. What can you do? Well, if you don't know what you're supposed to do, you watch. You simply watch what's going on. Like, say, somebody plays music. You listen. And you just follow those sounds. And eventually, you understand the point of the music. The point cannot be explained in words, because music is not words. But after a while, in listening to any music, you will understand the point of it. And that point will be the music itself. So in exactly the same way, you can listen to all experiences, because all experiences whatsoever are vibrations coming at you. Well, they, you are these vibrations, as a matter of fact. If you could really feel out what is happening, what you are aware of as you and as everything else is all the same. It's a, 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 a vibrations of all kinds, and they're on different bands of a spectrum. Sight vibrations, emotion vibrations, uh, touch vibrations, sound vibrations, all these things adding together are woven. It, it, all the different senses are woven, and uh, you get a pattern in the weaving, and that pattern is the picture of what you now feel. This thing is going to be... Now, instead of saying, what should I do about it? Because who knows what to do about it? To know what to do about this, you would have to know everything. And if you don't, then the only thing that, at least to begin with, watch what's going on. Watch not only what's going on on the outside, but also what's going on on the inside. Treat your own thoughts, your own reactions, your own emotions about what's going on outside as if those inside reactions were also outside things. That you're just watching. And follow, simply observe how they go. Note now, you may say, this is difficult. I am bored by watching what is going on. Let's say you, you, you sit quite still and you are simply observing what is happening. All the sounds outside, all the different shapes and lights in front of your eyes, all the feelings on your skin, inside your skin, belly rumbles, thoughts going on inside your head, chatter, chatter, chatter. I ought to be writing a letter to so-and-so. I should have done this, this, that all is built going on. See, you just watch it. But then you say to yourself, but this is boring. Now, watch that too. What is it? What, what kind of a funny feeling is it that makes you say, but this is boring? Where is it? Where do you feel it? I should be doing something else instead. What's that feeling? What part of your body is it in? Is it in here? Is it in here? Is it in the soles of your feet? Where is it? Boring. The feeling of boredom can be very interesting if you try to look it out. So you simply watch at everything going on without attempting to change it in any way without judging it without calling it good or bad you watch it that is the essential process of meditation
know what reality is, but we can't describe it. Just as we all know how to beat our hearts and shape our bones, but cannot say how it is done. Water becomes clear and calm only when left alone. I was trying to explain this morning that what, for want of a better word, we call meditation, or I sometimes prefer to say contemplation, is really supposed to be fun. And I have some difficulty in conveying this idea because everybody takes everything to do with religion seriously. And you must understand that I'm not a serious person. I may be sincere, but not serious. Because I don't think the universe is serious. And the trouble gets into the world very largely because the various beings take themselves seriously. Instead of playful. And after all, you must become serious if you think that something is desperately important. You will only think that something is desperately important if you're afraid of losing it. And if you're afraid of losing it, it isn't really worth having. People who drag on living because they're afraid to die will teach their children to do the same. And they will teach their children to live that way. So it goes on and on. If you were God, would you be serious? Would you want people to treat you as if you were serious? Would you want to be prayed to? Think of all the maudlin things that people say in their prayers. Would you want to listen to that all the time? <laughs> would you encourage it? No. <laughs> Not if you were God, no. <laughs> so in the same way, uh, <laughs> Meditation is different, you see, therefore, from the sort of things that people are supposed to take seriously. Because it doesn't have any purpose. When you talk about practicing meditation, it's not like practicing rifle shooting or playing the piano, which one does in order to attain a certain perfection. You practice in order to make perfect. You practice the piano to go on stage and perform. But you don't practice meditation that way. Because if you do, you're not meditating. The only way in which you can talk about the practice of meditation is to use the word practice in the same way as when somebody says that he practices medicine. It's his way of life. It's his vocation. He does it every day. Maybe he does it the same way every day. Maybe if it's good, that's fine. Because in meditation, you see, oh, there's no idea of time. In uh, practicing learning things, time is of the essence. Let's do it as fast as possible. Let's find a faster way of learning how to do this. In meditation, a faster way of learning is of no importance whatsoever. Because it is, its focus is always on the present. And there may occur growth in it. But it's the same way that a plant grows. Once upon a time in China, there was a family, farming family, and they were having dinner. And the oldest son came in late. And they said, why are you late for dinner? He said, I've been helping the wheat to grow. Oh. So they came out next morning and all the wheat was dead. Well, what happened was that he had gone and pulled each stalk up a little mm -hmm. to help it grow. So growth always occurs in a being like a plant, which is perfect at every step. 
No progress is involved in the transformation of an acorn into an oak. Because the acorn is a perfect acorn. And the sapling is a perfect sapling. And the big oak tree is a perfect oak, which again produces acorns. Perfect acorns. At every stage, it's there. Just as in the unfoldment of a musical composition, it is arrived at every stage. And it cannot be otherwise. So the meditation work is the same. Exactly the same. So we should not talk about beginners as distinct from experts. The new vocabulary. So it's, vi it's very difficult in the context of our competitive world to speak about things like this. To bring about the idea of doing something which is not acquisitive, which you're not going to get anything out of, because there's no one to get anything. When you understand what I've been talking about, about there being no experience uh, separate from experience, there's then there's no one to get anything out of life, or to get anything from meditation. So we have here a sort of law of reversed effort. You must therefore understand that as a background to anything said about techniques. Because whenever we talk about techniques, we seem to be talking about the competitive thing, mastery, the idea of mastery technique. But on the other hand, if you play a musical instrument, technique is very important in the making of a satisfactory sound. But if you force the learning of technique, or force the performance of it, everyone will hear it. And you will hear it, the forcing of it yourself. And it will be unmusical. And so, you have to address yourself to the playing of an instrument without hurry. And never, never force anything. And you will find there is a point then that, where the instrument seems to play itself. And when you get that peculiar feeling of the sound that is coming out of a flute or a violin string or whatever is as it were happening of itself, then you are playing the instrument properly. Same way if you sing. There comes a point when your voice takes over. This is the difference between spiration and inspiration. <laughs> you may say, uh, as Christians do, that the act of worship is inspired by the Holy Spirit that when monks are chanting, they are told that the Holy Spirit is, the, is, is chanting through them. They are flutes for the Holy Spirit. And this has a very precise and technical meaning. Because there is a way in, of producing the breath and of producing sound, where it comes of itself and you don't do it. And we will call that way of producing sound Holy Spirit. But it's based on breath. I pointed out in the first session that breath is a curious operation because it can be experienced as both a voluntary doing and an involuntary happening. You can do a breathing exercise and feel that I am breathing in just the same way as you can feel I am walking. But on the other hand, you breathe all the time when you're not thinking about it. And in that way, it's involuntary. You must breathe. 
And so it is the faculty, attending to which we can realize the unity of the voluntary and involuntary systems. So therefore, what is called Anapanasati in Buddhism means mindfulness of the breath, watching breath. And watching breath is fundamental in meditation. Because it's like sound. It's so easy to see the happening. As distinct from what we thought of as the doing. Breath happens. But the curious thing is about breath is that you can get with the happening of breath. And in getting with it, you can do extraordinary things with it. Anyone who swims knows this. Anyone who sings. Anyone who does, as a matter of fact, any athletic thing knows that the breathing is important. The alignment, the um, synchronization of what you're doing with your breathing is the whole art. As it is in archery also. <clears throat> but powerful breath is not worked by muscle power. It is worked by gravity, by weight. And what I would like you to do is if you will sit upright, and the reason for this is very simple, that your part of your body in which the breathing is occurring is unencumbered. And also sitting upright on the floor you are slightly uncomfortable so that you won't go to sleep. And in any peaceful and quiet state of mind, it's very easy to go to sleep. And now in this way, in this position, you simply become aware of your breathing without trying to do anything about it at all. You let it happen. What? You are also at the same time letting your ears hear whatever they want to hear. In other words, you let them hear just as you're letting your lungs breathe. Now, beyond this, can you get the idea of breathing out everything? Letting the breath fall outward without pushing it. And as you get to the end of the hour, do it with the same sort of feeling that you have when you let your body drop into a very comfortable bed. You drop out. Let go. Fall. Let weight do it. Then after a while, the breath will return. Don't pull. Let it fall back in. And drop in until you've had enough.
It's a good idea in this to breathe in through the nostrils and out through the lips, allowing there to be a slight sensation of moving air on your lips so that you know you're breathing and that you're not just straining your muscles. But never force anything. Just have the feeling of it going that way by virtue of weight. And then, as you let the breath fall outwards, you simply float a sound. Think of a sound that pleases you. No. That seems agreeable to your voice. And as you breathe out heavily, imagine that sound to yourself. Whatever you feel like. Hum it out loud.
other working in the is a completely <clears throat> liberated but soft and gentle letting of sound happen through us without the slightest sense of strength so that you are not singing here but it is singing with your voice don't premeditate a tune <clears throat> but let it come so that it's as if almost you were talking nonsense. I mean, you know, I can talk nonsense at the drop of a hat. I can do a whole lecture in a completely non-existent language. <laughs> but what you're doing is you're doing this gently with voice and you are simply preoccupied with it like easy humming to yourself. the sound of my voice. Don't bother about what it means. Your brain will take care of that by itself. Just let your eardrums respond as they will to all vibrations now in the air. Don't let yourself or your ears be offended by improper or unscheduled sounds. If, for example, the record is scratchy, okay. He wouldn't object if you were listening to it, sitting by a fire of crackling logs.
Let him ring. It's just the noise. And keep your tongue relaxed, floating easily in the lower jaw. Also stop frowning. Allow the space between your eyes to feel easy and open. And just let the vibrations in the air play with your ears. You must understand that in meditation we are concerned only with what is, with reality, nothing else. The past is a memory, the future an expectation. Neither past nor future actually exist. There is simply eternal now. So don't seek or expect a result from what you're doing. That wouldn't be true meditation. There's no hurry. Just now you're not going anywhere. Simply be here. Live in the world of sound. Let it play. That's all. actually hear anyone who is listening. Can you hear any difference between all these sounds on the one hand and yourself on the other? Now when you were thus absorbed in sound, where were you? This would be called a state of consciousness where we have a primitive form of samadhi. That is to say, we are happily absorbed in what we are doing and we have forgotten about ourselves. We can't very well do that and worry. <laughs> Or think anything serious. <laughs> and you'll notice that there's a special way of doing it. Because, I mean, we can go crazy. And we can do kind of a wild Indian chance. But in this, <clears throat> you are sort of straining too much as a rule. See? 
If you keep it down to a soft thing like this and get a floating feeling of the voice, if you instantly you feel any sound is uncomfortable, avoid it. Slip down if you're going too high. Slip up if you're getting too low. If your voice tends to change, follow its change. So that you're just swinging along with it. This is the point of why from ancient times people discovered humming and, and singing and everybody used to sing while they worked. But you will notice that today very few people sing at all. You have to make a thing on it. People are afraid of their voices. Their melodic voice is distinct from the spoken voice. I know an enormous number of people who never sing at all. Why is it that when the scriptures, the Upanishads, the sutras are read, they are invariably chanted? Because an extra dimension is added to the voice as soon as you bring a note into it. That's the divine note. The note sound, the singing sound, symbolically speaking. So, this is a form of what I would call free mantra chanting, like we did it then. Which isn't used much. It does give you, as you do it, a very good idea of what the meditative state is. Because it isn't just a letting happen, only the things going on around that's inside you as well. As distinct from the prescribed mantra, like Om Mani Padme Hum, or Om Ah Hum, uh, or um, Ram, Shri Ram, Jai Jai Ram, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, etc. Uh, each one of them has a different feeling to it. The Tibetan monks go down to an extraordinarily deep sound. They go as deep as you can get. There is a reason for this. That's very difficult to explain because you have to do it. But when you go down into sound as deeply as you can get, you're going to an extreme of the vibration. And everybody feels naturally that what is deep is sort of the underpinnings, the foundation. And when they go into that deep sound, they are literally exploring the depths of sound. As we say, go into it deeply. But you can very readily see, once you get into that, that you're, you're in another state of consciousness altogether. You're not anymore in fidgety, chattering to your skull every day. Uh, consciousness, what I call normal restlessness. <laughs> but in this way, uh, it always in, it, you get a sensuous feeling of the breath, that it's very enjoyable to breathe. And then you will find this will help in the quality of the sound you produce. And we, will, of course, have to get away from some of our musical prejudices when we do this. Now, I know, I'm sorry, but everybody thinks that to spend a lot of time gently humming nonsense to yourself is a waste of time. Uh, what are you going to do with the time that you save? <laughs> <laughs> But 
the point though is with all this, the first thing we have to understand is what I will call deep listening. And very few people ever really listen. Because instead of receiving the sound, they make comments on it all the time. They're thinking about it. And so the sound is never fully heard. You just have to let it take over. Let it take you over completely. Then you get the samadhi state of becoming it. And it also means that you abandon your socially nervous personality. Where one of the reasons why people don't sing is that they hear so many masters on records and they're ashamed of their own voices and think there's no point singing unless I'm good at it. Well, that's like saying there's no point my doing anything at all unless I'm particularly gifted at it, which is ridiculous. But singing, uh, is of course very good for, for you, but we won't mention that, because it brings in too much purpose in And, uh, but it's like a, a child will make noises because of the absorbing interest of making noises. The child child will make all sorts of <laughs> See? To explore the possibilities of what you can do with a voice. See? Ah. <laughs> you don't see adults going around, do you? They're all too shy. <laughs> See? Tremendous fun. <laughs> but all this all this is perfectly incorporable with the meditation. It embarrasses the hell out of some people. So what are you laughing at? No, I don't see any point in laughing at something funny. <laughs> I had a friend who was a theological student. He was very fat. And he used to sit on the elevated train that went from Evanston into Chicago, where the seats ran right down the side of the train. So he'd sit in the middle of one side, and everybody in the car could see him. This fat fellow was sitting and he'd get on at Evanston. He'd sit there on a kind of vacant, and he'd start to chuckle at himself. <laughs> <laughs> and slowly he'd work it out. <laughs> and he'd with all its flesh, <laughs> vibrating. And by the time they got into Chicago, the whole car was <laughs> <laughs>
Good evening.